the shaping of leadership, especially within the lives of males in God's kingdom. I'd like to welcome a friend of mine, Kwame Lofe. Nice having you here with us this morning. It's really good to be with God's people. It's truly good to be around people that love God very, very much. Joshua, in the years he was in his 80s when he spoke to, the, to Israel, and he spoke to them about the nature of God. When you speak to people around you, they, many people will tell you, I am a Christian. And you will ask them, do you worship with God's people? And they say, well, I, I follow God very closely and I worship Him in my way. And you'd say to them, do you spend time serving Him? And they say, I serve Him in other ways. I give of my means to the poor. I help those that are in need and I speak encouragement to those of my colleagues around me. And then you ask, are you involved in the inner working of the body of Christ that He's attached you to? And they say, well, most of the time I don't get on very well with a few people, so I find it far more encouraging and stimulating for me to work on my own where I can do a lot of good with no restrictions. This morning I want to speak to us as men, and this lesson is as applicable to women, as applicable to young men, and also to children. Jesus Christ makes a funny comment, and He says, no one can serve two masters. He constantly appeals to people to make good choices. Joshua speaks to the people and he says to them the same thing. You need to choose for yourself who you will worship today. And Joshua was a young man at the time when he took over from Moses. We know the story that Moses died and he took over the mantle from Moses. We also know that he was one of the 12 spies that went into the land to spy out the land. And he was one of two men that made it through the 40 years of wanderings that actually lived from his generation. Everyone else died. And Moses understood and he imprinted this in the heart of Joshua. That whenever you make a choice for God, you must remember with the choice of following God, there are massive implications. So often people will say, you need to make a choice for this and make a choice for good. And we all would say amen to that. But one of the critical things that I want to get across to you and I, not only that we must make a choice, but the fact that we get to choose. Because when I read this text, I looked at it and Moses still says to them, I want you to make a choice. Calvinism, as we have, many of us have been raised in, will tell you, that no, you don't have a choice. God has chosen you. And God has chosen you above everybody else. And everybody else outside of God's choice will go to hell. They can do nothing about it. It flies in the face of a holy God who gives us a choice to make to follow Him. I want you to know something about God and even about Jesus Christ and now also about the leadership of Joshua. He never cloaks following Jesus in romance, in other words, to numb you with excitement and say, I want to just follow Jesus. I want to be his child. But he sobers up the people and says to them, I want to speak to you about a few things. I want to tell you some things today that are problematic about following God. They are massive problems because if we follow God, we must understand there's a few things about him we need to know. I want to back up very quickly into the book of Acts chapter 2, where we find the addition of 3,000 people submitting to the gospel and being baptized into Christ. They left something, and they went to something. <coughs> In other words, when you and I became Christians, we left a life that was mucky, that was untidy, filled with relative truths. And Joshua will speak to the people this morning, and it said to them, I want to speak to you about the first difficulty you will have in choosing God. The first difficulty you have is choosing God as a person who lives in holiness. 
Now, I don't know what you, your view is on that. But the idea of holiness is of absolute purity. The idea of exclusivity dedicated to good work in Christ and God. God is holy. He is morally pure. He never dabbles in sin or evil. But he can turn everything for good. Peter would speak to the church that are scattered. And he would say to the church in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he would say to them, but just as he have called you is holy, so you are holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. The idea of holiness runs through the scriptures and through the hearts of all the men that wrote the books of the Bible. In the Corinthian letter, we find a church that is deeply carnal. But inside of all of the writings of Paul, he runs it against the backdrop to remind them that you are the temple of God in which the Holy Spirit has made his dwelling. In other words, because you are sinning, because you are disobedient, doesn't change the fact that you are the house of God. And so what he's saying to them is that I want you to know what your sins are, but I want you to come in and clean it up and tidy up your life. God lives in his church, and it's the role of eldership and leadership to keep the church pure, to guide it in a loving, kind way. When folks struggle to say, let's get back on track, let's do it again. God lives in us, and we must keep his temple pure. The second difficulty we may have, which comes out of the text that we've read in the book of Joshua, he speaks about the second character of God, that God is a jealous God. In fact, we will find over in the Old Testament that God says, I am jealous, my name is jealous. And the idea behind that is that God says, I intensely envy that which belongs to me. And so when we say that God is jealous, God brooks no rivals. He repeats in his word, and he says there, you will have no gods before me. From the lips of Jesus, he makes the comment and says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He says, I want you, and I want all of you. I will share you with no one. The third difficulty that Joshua raises with the church, he says that you must put away your idols. In other words, whatever territory that you conquer and you do well in, you need to put away your idols. God will bless you in ways that you have not even begun to imagine. God will bless you financially. He will bless you with influence. But when that becomes your God and that becomes the ultimate end and it is not submitted to the glory of God that has just opposed the true God in your heart. And God's saying to you, you must never have an idol before me. He speaks to all of us as people that love training and education, that you might be interested in enhancing your career or increasing your knowledge and your education. Maybe you feel that you need to improve your material abundance and make your home comfortable. And that innately is not wrong. But if that supersedes what God requires from you, you have just raised an idol. If you have been blessed with influence and political clout and popularity, and that becomes about you, you have just raised an idol. And I need to warn you that what Joshua is doing to the people, he's saying you need to understand the person with whom you are dealing with. And so often when one deals with folk and even when one speaks about conversion, it becomes abundantly clear that folk have got no clue who God is. And so often we find that there's a rude awakening when they understand the nature of God and that He cannot alter who He is. The fourth difficulty we find in choosing God, that our worship and service belongs to Him. He speaks in verse 14, and he says the following, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. In other words, what he's saying to you and I is that when you become God's child, you commit your entire life to Him. 
It, everything is about Him. When you do a presentation before a board of directors or clients, or even when you speak to somebody at a hospital bed about God, it is all about Him. It is all about God. It's all to His glory. We often find so often that sometimes God blesses us in ways that we could never have imagined the first day we had a relationship with Him. And we use the very blessings that God has given us against Him to excuse our presence in worship with His children and also in serving Him. We do not make our financial means available to Him for His glory and His expansion of His kingdom. And we diligently keep it behind because we feel that we're entitled to it. What God is trying to say to His people, He says you actually don't want to worship God. Let me just say to you, don't do it. Don't do it. Because he's saying that God wants you to give your entire heart, heart to him. And that's the fifth problem. In verse 23, he says to them, Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to God, the God of Israel. When you work with people that are having affairs, you find out that the husband or the wife is present in the marriage, but absent in the relationship. The heart is somewhere else. A friend of mine made a comment to me many years ago when I addressed him about an area of his life that was challenged. He said to me, I come home, don't I? And I said, you come home presently, but your heart is under the sheet somewhere else. The key idea is God is speaking to us and saying, I want not just your presence. I want your entire heart. I want your entire being. I want your connectedness with me in such a deep way that I know that I have your heart that has healed it to me in its entirety. Solomon writes, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Jesus says, out of the heart comes the issues of life. Paul says, in the scripture, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am just a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy so that I can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, I have, if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames in martyrdom but have not love, I gain nothing. Let me say this to you, brethren. And let me tell you what underlies the principle is sometimes the way that we parent. We throw things at people. Let me give you money. Let me give you something to entertain you. God says, I want you. I found the most happiest children that I've ever been blessed to work with have been children that had their parents. There was a wonderful friend of mine. He's not a Christian yet. And he's a professor of physics. And I sat with him one day and spoke to him about himself. And I asked him, tell him, me about you. And he said to me, Derek, I've realized, and he says, the one particular day he was at a lesson at church, he went home and took his television and put it on the streets. He said, I realized that my family is my life. And he says, when people are watching television till the wee hours of the morning, he said, I'm spending time with my children and seeing them off to bed. He says, Derek, I feel ashamed because I don't pray with my children as I should. But he says, they know that they are loved and that they are put to bed. And I'm the last person to say goodnight to. Another difficulty in choosing God is living up to our promises. When we choose God, God warns us in saying, don't make a promise you don't want to keep. Joshua warns the church and he says to them, God will bring disaster on you. He will destroy you and he'll make an end of you. And the idea here is that he's saying to us is that every part of our life must be so committed to him that no way will God ever doubt that I have chose, chosen him. Every part of my being is sub, subjected to the purposes of God. I wonder how much of what the consequences that we are living in this country is due to the choices we have made before in history. Don't think that I'm pointing out, I'm talking just the last 20 years. 
John Bunyan made a comment and he says, I will stay in this dungeon until the moss grows out of my eyebrows before I make a butchery of my conviction and a slaughterhouse of my conscience. When you and I walk with God, you cannot walk a duplicitous life. When you walk with God, you must walk single-mindedly. There is nothing that rivals God. And this is exactly what Joshua is trying to get across to his people. He challenged them to, and warned them. And he says, when you choose God, he says, you actually don't want to serve him. But in verse 15, he says to them, choose for yourself. And the idea here is that, that what he's saying to them is that maybe today you are where you are. And maybe this is for us to talk through. Maybe you are here today because of very bad choices of parents. <clears throat> maybe today you are carrying the emotional scars of personal mistakes and failures. Maybe today you've had very bad parenting. But God still says to you, that will never excuse you from making a personal choice for Him. Each man must make his own choice. Each man will have to face God judgment and give an account of his life. Each man will face God on that day and give an account of his or her life and say, Father, this is what my life was about. The next we must know is that God does not deal in the past. And maybe today you're saying, Derek, I'm bearing so much emotional scars of my past. I even feel too ashamed to look back on my life. I want to say this to you this morning. Joshua challenges you and he says, choose this day whom you will serve. Paul will tell you, today is the day of salvation. He would say, now is the right time. Now is the accepted time. Jesus will taught you to pray, give us this day our daily bread. He didn't worry about tomorrow. He didn't worry about yesterday. Yesterday I had a privilege of sitting with Bernie Manzoni in hospital. I don't know how many times or if you've spent time with Bernie at all, but Bernie is struggling. Bernie's health is failing. They found a massive carcinoma in his left lung. It is pressing on his pulmonary artery, and also they're not too sure whether it will stop his breathing completely. He struggles to breathe. But while I was talking with Bernie yesterday, I asked Bernie, and I said, Bernie, how are you doing? He said to me, I'm doing well, Derek. How are you? How Sue? How are the kids? And I'm thinking to myself, did I miss a trick? I'm in hospital, or are you in hospital? So I said to Bernie, tell me about yourself, Bernie. He says, ah, oh, I'm boring, man. Other people are more interesting. Please don't try to psychologize the man, okay? Because if you do, you could perfectly say, well, he's doing a projection. He's now sitting in denial and all that kind of rubbish. Let me tell you where Bernie's at. Bernie is struggling because late last night I got an SMS that the cancerous growth is inoperable. In other words, they won't be able to get to it to take it out. So they may need to radiate it or maybe try chemotherapy. But Bernie said to me, Derek, after I've seen the specialist, I'm going home. Because I'd rather lie in my own bed and come back for treatment than lie here day in and day out and put pressure on my wife. Bernie said to me, I said, Bernie, give me the secret of your smiles. Come on, you've got nothing to lose. He said, let me tell you how I live. He said to me, Derek, I live in the present. I live for now. He says, I live not for yesterday. He said, the old Bernie is gone because Christ had redeemed his sins. He says, the new Bernie has not yet fully formed, and that's about tomorrow. And I don't worry about that. He says, but this is me. And I'm cool. I said to him, Bernie, how do you think about the diagnosis? He says, Derek, I don't need to be a genius to know that I'm going to die. The only thing I don't know yet is how and when. But if I continue worrying about those, Derek, I will be the most miserable man on this earth. If you know Bernie, if you complain around Bernie, he will tell you 
Stop complaining. But Bernie spoke to me yesterday and he said, Derek, I live in the present. And so I quoted a little phrase which is not mine that says, Yesterday is gone, tomorrow has been promised to no man. That is why today is called the present. It's a present from God. And then I looked up a poem last night or a couple of sayings. Today is the only tie day. Now is the only time for choosing. Tomorrow is the chain that binds us to sinful habits. Tomorrow is the locked door that shuts us out of the house of our dreams. Tomorrow is the downward path that leads us into a land of regret. Tomorrow is the song that seduces us with a path of duty. Tomorrow is the sleep that paralyzes lazy people. Tomorrow is the sword of self-destruction on which many commit spiritual suicide. Tomorrow is the word painted over the broad way that leads to hell. And Bernie would say to you, Today is the word from the Lord. Today is the word of the Holy Spirit. And so if Joshua was here, Joshua would say to you today, don't harden your heart. Don't try to get tough with God. Be malleable. Be gentle. Know this, that <coughs> either way us as men lead our family down a path of righteousness. There must be a clear bell of righteousness in our homes. Joshua knew that others in his family circle and in his friendship circle would respond to God. Joshua understood that he needed to take the initiative and say, I don't know what your decisions are, but what I do know is that I will be held accountable for my family. And so for me and my household, we will follow God. I'm going to show you a clip this morning, a clip from a movie that is a wonderful movie called Coach Carter. I'm going to tell you some of the background very quickly as we are prepared to put the clip on for you. It's a movie by Coach Carter. And it's an interesting one because during the time of his, he was a teacher and he taught in a school called Richmond High School. But he was called to be a coach of a basketball team. And during his time of leadership of that team, the team did so well and won every single match. But one of the greatest challenges of that team was that all the boys' grades were slipping. One youngster actually couldn't do his grades, couldn't study very hard, and opted out of, this, out of the team. And then he met with the parents, and he said to them, I want you to make a covenant with me and an agreement with me and a contract with me that your child's grades must be at least C+, plus to be able to play in the basketball team. Sad part about it is, that the parents opposed him, and so did the school board. Coach Carter turned around and he took a chain, a massive chain, and he closed the gym. He said, you will not play one single game until you get your grades up, because that's the agreement we made. His decision was overturned, and the board decided the kids will play basketball. Let me show you this clip. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry about that. Thank you. 
cut the chain off the door. But they can't make us play. We've decided we're going to finish what you started, sir. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. Sir, I just want to say thank you. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. All of you. I have been honored to work in the hearts of so many men and women. And I found that so often our fear to step into that relationship with God is because we fear we're going to fail. This particular poem that this gentleman quoted was a quote from Mary Ann Williamson who wrote that particular poem. She wrote the poem and has been erroneously Credited to Nelson Mandela, he did not write it. Marianne Williamson did. In her poem, she makes more mention. She says, it's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, why am I so brilliant? Gorgeous, handsome, talented, and fabulous. I'll tell you something, some of those we can relate to. Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make both manifest the glory of God within us. It is not just in some, but it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we consciously give other people permission to do the same. And we, as we are liberated from our fear... Our presence automatically liberates others. So maybe today you as a father or as a mother are fearing, if I follow God, will I keep my promises? Will he destroy me? Jesus says to you, I am with you all the way. He says to you, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. God says to you, don't fear failure. And I love a sermon a brother made many years ago. He said, it's not about falling. It's about falling forward into the arms of Jesus. Because truth be told, Peter was the only man that had the guts to get out of a boat and to walk on water. Nobody has since, not even Chris Angel. He's a liar. The reason I'm telling you this today is that so often being a Christian takes more guts. And it takes more gumption to be different. It takes a lot of courage to want to be holy. It takes lots more guts to be definitively truthful to God. It's sometimes you've got to die to self and say no to things that you so badly and your flesh so badly craves for and say, I will do it for the glory of God and I will say no to that because when I say no to that which is mediocre, I say yes to that which is excellent. And so today I ask of you, how are you going to live your life this week? 
Will it be one of definitiveness? One of so much courage that when anyone asks you to live and ask you, who are you? You can say, I'm a Christian. Bernie Manzoni is seriously ill. And he's probably one of the finest men that I've been blessed to serve in all my life. And my heart aches this morning for him. Because he loves God. I said to Bernie, what's the most definitive day in your life? Bernie says, the day that I was baptized into Christ. Because that day I knew that I could be whole again. So this morning I'm not preaching his sermon of a funeral. Not at all. I'm speaking about a man that has inspired me in more ways than I can even begin to imagine. And I pray today that you will write an SMS to Helen and maybe give her a call. And if she says, I can't talk now, don't be offended. She's hurting. She's struggling. But just be there for her and pray for her. Don't just go home and say, well, we'll pray and then come next week Sunday. Oh, my word, I forgot. These people are children of God. And we need to be there for them. The last comment I'm going to make and then we're done. Joshua does a very simple thing. <clears throat> and he puts a stone before the people. And he says, I'm going to call the stone as a witness against you. I'm going to call the stone as a witness against you. And then they say, we are witnesses to our commitment to God. This morning, what I'm saying to you is not to plunge you into guilt, but hopefully to propel you into a new level of discipleship. When God, as the rock of God, is the one that, we, that witnesses everything that we do. But maybe you read that in a very condemnatory way, but I want you to read it in an applauding way, that God says, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you that you can make a choice. Like those young boys, when their own parents and a school board who should have acted in their interest and said, we will back you up, when playing basketball becomes more important than education and there's no balance and a man literally got to grab his goods and say, this place is not for me. The story goes on. I didn't end there. After he went through and the young boys themselves committed to do things his way like we do with God, right at the end of a movie you find there's a, lot of, a whole list of the accomplishments of those men. Every one of those young men went on to illustrious careers in education, in sport, and also in academics. All because one man said to them, don't be afraid, don't let your fears hold you back, but let God capture your fears and propel you to a new level of obedience so that the world may know that He has made the difference in your life. Maybe this morning you're subject to the gospel invitation where you need to step over that line and say, I want to follow Christ today. I'm done with low living. I know what's required of me. I want to do that now. And maybe today you are so down, you might say, I need to just ask the elders to pray with me, pray for me. That can be done for you this morning. I pray that we all stand and sing the song of encouragement together as we both close the service this morning to His praise and glory.